Okay, so um, cryptocurrencies, um, transactions, but what, how, how does it differ from a normal financial system like Visa, for example? Yeah, so the ledger is public. Uh, you can see all the transactions. So it's a public, public ledger. Do you know who transacted with whom? So you see the addresses, but you don't know to whom they belong, right? But if you could de-anonymize it, you would then know who transacted with whom in yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, do you have some uh, currencies that prevent you doing that? Yep, you do. So th there are some blockchains which kind of uh, you s you don't see who transacted with whom, but you can verify that the interested parties can verify that they paid each other. So like if I need to pay you, I know your address, so I pay you, and the transaction is locked. It gets verified, but whoever verifies it doesn't know who transacted, and then we can see it that I paid you, but nobody else knows those addresses. Uh, and the, and they cannot de-anonymize it, right? So it's sort of a, a system in which we can guarantee that, like the system guarantees that I paid you, but you cannot prove outside that to the third party that I paid you, right? So if the uh, if there is some sort of a case where I need to demonstrate, like you need to demonstrate that I paid you, then you cannot do that, right? Um, so what um, what are the other implications of of blockchain technology? So it, it is some sort of a system of distributed nodes with a public ledger. The ledger is visible to everybody. Sometimes it's encrypted, so then we don't know certain properties. Sometimes it's not, uh, and then we have those participants participating. Um, anybody can do that. So what what is else different? compared to Visa with this system. So let's say 10 of us join Visa cards and we pay each other using Visa. Um, can we do that? Not really. Like you have to have a merchant account. You have to be kind of a trusted financial institution to become a available, to become kind of a, um, a um, able to ask, accept the, the transactions, you have to join the, the visa, they do some uh, know your customers and kind of anti money laundering uh, things in. Uh, with Bitcoin, for example, you don't have any of that. Uh, we can just join and send each other transactions. Uh, the other difference is that when we send each other transactions, we do that in kind of a peer to peer fashion. So with visa, the, the funds go to certain hops through certain uh, money uh, processors to Visa and then from Visa. So there is a kind of a central system. Uh, whereas with a uh, system like Bitcoin, it goes uh, in a peer to peer fashion, right? Okay, so what, what else is different? It's used a lot for, for, for dark web goodies. Yeah, uh, why? Yeah, no control. It's kind of uh, anonymous or semi-anonymous, pseudo-anonymous. Um, so easily deployed for dark web uh, marketplaces. Good, good currency to do. Uh, if you paid for drugs using Visa, of course it's locked. But if you paid for them using Bitcoin, yes, that's kind of much more privacy preserving. Um, and if you're buying something online, you cannot really pay them cash, right? Uh, if you go to a dealer on the street, you pay cash. So that's maintain anonymity of the payment, but online you cannot do that. So online, really, you only have those kind of cryptocurrencies uh, being able to do that. They were in the past some money processors which were uh, doing illegal things. Uh, so they were used for some of the online payments for drugs and so on. But most of them didn't live for long. They, they were kind of... Uh, prosecuted and shut down uh, for doing this because uh, 
due to regulations, you cannot officially run a business not knowing who your customers are. You have to know and you have to know uh, who pays whom for what. Uh, so if there is a well-known uh, terrorist organization or kind of a drug dealer, then the bank is responsible for making sure that the payments don't go through, right? Um, okay, so that's correct. What else? What else is different? So who controls how much one Bitcoin is, is worth? Who controls how much one Norwegian krona is worth? <laughs> the magic hand of the market. Uh, to some extent, yes. Um, so what happens if the Norwegian Central Bank suddenly prints one trillion of Norwegian krona and puts them on the market? So the magic hand of the market will what make? Will make the Norwegian krona be very cheap, right? What if the Norwegian Central Bank decides to uh, print less money? So they take some used up money, let's say they got half a million very dirty used up Norwegian kronas and they destroy it and, and they don't print the new equivalent into the market. What will happen then? It will probably rise in value a little bit because there will be less of Norwegian krona on the market, potentially. So yes, the, the, the price of krona is regulated by market. But the central bank has some instruments and some mechanisms to influence the, the price of the krona. Indirectly, but they can. They can lower the interest rates, they can make the interest rates higher, they can you know, play with some mechanisms to influence the currency. Right? With Bitcoin or some cryptocurrencies, who decides how much they are worth? Yeah, so there is a market again. So there are there is a uh, demand and uh, amounts which are available, right? Um, so it's kind of self-regulated by the market. Um, but you don't have a central bank, right? Um, so you do have some spec large speculators potentially, which can dump suddenly a large amount of uh, Bitcoin onto the market, which will definitely lower the price of the of the Bitcoin, right? So the original people behind the release of the Bitcoin, they, the famous Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, they seem 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 still to hold a substantial amount of coins which were initially mined. And if they suddenly release that bulk of money into the market, the price will go down. Uh, but there is no institution. There is nothing, nobody controlling the printing or doing this, right? So it's kind of a deregulated. Uh, so that's another distinguishing feature between the centrally managed currencies like uh, Norwegian Krona or US dollar and the um, and the non-managed currencies like the cryptocurrencies. Also, the central banks agree on some bank exchange rates, right? So if the central bank in Norway says to all the banks that the rate between US dollar and Norwegian krona is going up or down, it will influence the market as well, right? Uh, so it's not just the perception of people how much the US dollar is worth, it's also the standard bank rates which dictate that. Uh, in some countries, it's very strict, so they regulate the banks' uh, exchange rates and everybody else, so they have like a fixed exchange rates. Uh, and some, it's a little bit market-driven, uh, so they have a bit flexibility of how uh, how that works. But in general, they kind of uh, regulate the the official exchange rates as well. So. So are there advantages of having a deregulated currency versus a regulated currency? What are the you know, positive and negative aspects? For example, power drying and then decentralized um, communication. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Bitcoin has lots of power sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you there is a certain cost of maintaining some of those systems. And in the case of Bitcoin, they, they are using a proof of work, which means you have to prove that you spend time calculating something, which as a side effect drains the electricity. So that's, you know, you're proving that you did some work by ba basically burning electricity, right? Um, but they are potentially different systems to do that. So you could have some sort of systems based on stake or um, a different way of um, securing the transactions, right? So that is a feature of the current system, but that's not an inherent feature. What, what other features are there to distinguish those two? So, yeah, one, one of the feature we already mentioned, which is that it's not regulated, which means the, uh, the value is almost exclusively driven by the market. So if people find it useful and find it uh, worth, the, the value goes up and then it kind of stays there, right? It's sort of like gold. Uh, gold, of course, is useful for jewelry and for um, uh, some electronics. But the, the kind of a market value of gold um, is not really related to how useful gold is. It's sort of more of a, a storage of value type of mechanism uh, instrument that people use as a, a way to kind of maintain consistent kind of value of something for a longer period of time. So if I have some uh, monetary value, uh, I can buy real estate, which is which tends also to not devalue uh, because you know people need to live somewhere. Uh, or you can kind of buy gold and uh, the relationship, let's say, between milk and petrol and gold and other day-to-day um, -day, um, uh, things that you need to buy, the ratio of how they cost to how the gold costs, they tend to be stable. There are some fluctuations, but they tend to be stable, right? Whereas the currency itself is not really stable. They tend to devalue. So, you know, if you have, uh, I don't know, 100 krona, you know, 30 years ago, and you have 100 krona now, the, the value is different. You could buy different things today for the same amount that you could have buy, bought 30 years ago. Um, all right, so those are kind of the main characteristics. There is uh, another type of blockchain, which is allowing you, like, most blockchains allow you to do the transaction, so they have to have a script which kind of executes some logic of hashing and encrypting and uh, calculating some of the things. And in Bitcoin, it's quite restricted and quite small to a couple of um, uh, cryptographic operations and kind of uh, value check operations. In some blockchains, like in Ethereum, it's very open. So you can do any program which runs on the blockchain as a, as a script. And the property is that this program can execute without anybody running it. it. It's actually, it's run on all the nodes which participate in the network, but nobody's really responsible for computing it. So it's sort of like a cloud computer, which nobody really owns. It just runs the code which people put in, right? So I can come up with uh, some sort of uh, logic, for example, for, uh, uh, for ensuring some transactions or for uh, let's say uh, generating an image if you give me some some fee and then it happens autonomously it happens automatically like I don't run it, it the network runs it and then if you pay you pay a little bit of a fee to run this computation and this computation executes and happens right so if you have uh, like some generated image you can kind of uh, say okay I want a new generated image you have to pay a little bit to for the cost of running that computation, and then it happens. And that computation is not owned by anybody. Like, um, there is obviously some programmer who wrote the, the, the logic, but then once it is deployed, uh, it is kind of in, in the ether um, without uh, any human associated with it, right? Um, so there is a number of, I don't have a, a monitor, but you can, uh, I, I will post on the wiki page like a browser which allows you to see all those programs which people put online for various things. There are clocks, there are some games, um, there are a gazillion of different use cases where you can use it 
if you want to pay a little bit. And we have to pay a little bit because otherwise if there was no fee, uh, people could write a program which runs forever, right? You would have an infinite loop which just runs forever. And then if I have to verify that your program executed correctly, I would have to download it, run it, and then it will use up all my computing resources. So to prevent that, um, there is a kind of a cost associated with running those, those programs. It's the same as with cloud computing. You have some fees for running the programs for bandwidth and for storage. On those systems, you have some fees for storage and for running the code. Depending on the instruction, there is a kind of a fee associated, it, associated with it. And then you, let's say if you run a contract which has those instructions, you have to pay a certain fee. Uh, so at the, at the end of the day, you have a number of different programs which run on the internet, which nobody owns and nobody really controls or manages. It, it just is there, right? And most of them are not used because they're not that useful. But some are useful and then people pay a little bit to, to, to run it, right? So it is kind of like, a, like the ideal uh, use case scenario for testing ideas. Because if you have contracts which are useful, people tend to use them and they kind of self-perpetuate themselves. And if you have uh, contracts which are not useful, then people never really use them. So they sit there, occupy space, but they are not being used. Uh, so if you were to make profits, you can only make profits on things that actually generate the, uh, uh, the usage pattern. It's kind of the same as with Google Play or App, Apple uh, App Store. So if you release an app which nobody uses, then you have no income. But if you release the app which people use, then you have income because they download it and they pay for it, right? Um, but in this case, you don't have an account associated. So it's actually like a, a anonymous, a potentially anonymous, attached to nobody kind of thing. Uh, and it can be free. So there are some, for example, if you want to play some gambling game with somebody else, let's say, um, I don't know, we want to play poker, right? So all of us like to play poker and we'd like to, to play poker what, online uh, because we're not in the same room. Like, now we could play physically, but um, so what do we have to do? We have to go to some online casino, right? So if we go to some online casino, uh, usually among you, there is a house. So you play poker either with the house or with other players and with the house, right? Uh, and you play in such a way that the house takes always a certain percentage, right? Uh, so the odds, like if we play uh, let's play, let's say we want to play 50, 50 game with two people. So I want to play, uh, I don't know, uh, rock, paper, scissors with Sabina. Right. Uh, and it's 50, 50, right. Uh, either she wins or I win. And we, we go to online casino, which allows us playing, uh, rock, paper, scissors. And, you know, if I win, I usually get 49.9% because zero one percent that the house takes, right. It's a kind of a fee I have to pay, right. Uh, because we have to have a trusted third party to allow us to kind of gamble with each other, right? Uh, but if you go online to those contracts, you can have a contract for playing um, rock, paper, scissors with somebody else, and there is no fee. It's really 50-50. Why? Because it costs nothing to run it, right? I mean, we have to pay a little bit to run it, but nobody really gets the money. Uh, it's just the cost for maintaining the infrastructure, right? So we don't pay to keep the trust. We just pay a little bit of fee to maintain the infrastructure, but there is no house. So you can have um, games of chance without a trusted third party which manages the trust. It's just between us. And I know that she cannot cheat me and she knows I cannot cheat her because that's built in into the rules of the game. Uh, the, ga the rules of the game are such that we cannot cheat each other, right? Uh, that it's like so clear and so well defined that either she wins or I win or it's a draw. And if it's draw, we both get the funds back, right? Uh, so we put a bet from both ends, then we play uh, online uh, and then we do that, right? So a side note to this, how would you play uh, rock, paper, scissors online with somebody else? So let's, let's say, how would you play rock, paper, scissors over the phone with somebody else? 
<laughs> exactly, but that's a bit, that is a little bit problematic, right? To say, okay, one, two, three, and then you have to say something at the same time. But, you know, if you just a little bit later than the other person, you can cheat, right? So we, we, it, would not, it would not work, right? Um, so, and online is even worse, like through email, for example. How would you play a rock, paper, scissors with Sabina through email? <laughs> yeah, any ideas? Yeah, so you would need to have a trusted third party, yeah. right? You need some sort of a server. We both email our vote to the server, and then the server says, okay, uh, she won, uh, whatever, right? So I say paper, and she says uh, uh, rock, and then the server says Mario's won. Right? And if I said paper, like I emailed my vote to the server, the server says nothing, right? So I have to trust the server that the server doesn't tell her that I said rock before she casts her vote, right? Uh, because if there, there is a leakage of information, if I said, you know, rock, and the server says, say, say, scissors, say, scissors. <laughs> it says, scissors, it's like, oh yeah, she won, <laughs> right? Um, so we have to have trust that the, the server is trusted. But let's say we don't want to trust anybody. I just want to play with her. I just want to email her and sh I want her to email me back, right? How would you do that? Very good, exactly. So what we would do is I would, I have three choices, one, two, three. Uh, so I pick my choice and I hash it with a particular key, right? So then I hash it with a particular key, I sent her the, the hashed version. So she has it, right? And now I, I wait for her to send me her hashed version, right? And she does that. So now we have, we know about each other hashed versions of the votes. And now I tell her, okay, now you have to show me your key so I can decrypt what you voted. And I show you my key, right? And it doesn't matter in which order we do that, uh, as long as we both get both keys. So then we can decrypt it and we can see who said what, right? I can see what she said and she can see what I said. And I cannot change my mind, right? Because um, the hashing functions are in such a way that once she has the hash, only one uh, value kind of hashes to that with that key, right? Unless I can find the hash collision and I have a hash with two keys hashes to two different answers, right? So if I spend my time finding the hash collision, then I could cheat. But normally we can assume that some of those cryptographic properties are hold and finding the hash collision is nearly impossible. Not impossible, but it would take me incredible amount of computing power and a, a long time before I can find the collision, right? Uh, so then um, I, you know, and also we can say instead of hashing rock, paper, scissors, I have to pa hash rock plus whatever salt she gives me first, right? So she says, for this session, the salt is uh, Jupiter. So you have to say scissors with Jupiter, and then I have to quickly ha find the collision with the, you know, different options. <laughs> so that wouldn't work, right? So if we kind of salt the, the answer with something which we agree on the time, uh, then we can play rock, paper, scissors through email without... Um, putting trust into anything. The only trust which we put is that it's very hard to find a collision, right? All right, so given this long introduction, um, if you have system like this, uh, that you can program um, some useful things, uh, why people don't do that? Why don't we see a kind of applications being run in this fashion uh, that nobody really owns? What do you think? Yeah, very good reason, right? <laughs> like, what's the point? <laughs> like, like, nobody profits from it. So then what's the point, right? Yes, no, like, you can't really trust because there's nobody who can play anything. Like, if somebody is uh, uh, governing the application, then you know that that person will be liable for any thing, but if nobody is uh, behind that thing, then if something wrong happens, then there is nobody to blame. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's also a good argument. So one argument is that 
why would you do something that doesn't benefit you? Uh, well, I mean, you could do that, right? Um, and the second argument is, what if something goes wrong, that there is nobody really to blame? Um, and, and things go wrong, so people do write buggy software and those, some of those contracts have some vulnerabilities and they are not perfect. But let's hypothesize that it is kind of a perfect, there is no bugs, that it actually works. Uh, we still have the first issue, like who would spend time developing it if, if it doesn't pay your bills, right? Let's say you spend a week doing something. Uh, well, you could, right? There are some games. Uh, where people publish on Apple Store or Google Play, where, which are free with no ads, and some are released it, right? So you can have like a motivation for building something and releasing it to general public for free. Uh, so you could imagine people doing that with the, those systems as well. Uh, and one of the reasons why it doesn't happen much yet, I think, is because it's costly for people to use it. Like it cost me nothing to download a game and play it, uh, which if, if the game is for free uh, and it's just an entertainment value. But let's say I have some sort of a system which is doing something with this blockchain uh, model. And I even though it's free, I still need to pay a little bit to run those contracts. It's not really free, right? Uh, you can say, yeah, it's the same with the mobile. Like I have to pay for electricity. I had to buy the mobile phone. There are some kind of hidden costs as well. It's not entirely free, right? Um, but it, it is kind of um, um, complicated to analyze exactly what and how things cost, right? So that kind of relates to a lot of free services that we uh, use every day. So, you know, you use Gmail for free, but is it really free? Uh, not really, right? So you're giving up uh, some of the privacy that you have, you're giving some data to uh, to Google for being able to advertise to you better. They monetize on, on that information uh, and so on and so forth. So like, you know, establishing exactly how much you pay for what uh, is, is a little bit tricky. And some one of the reason of why those uh, the, the, those services don't happen, I think, is that it's kind of not really free in the sense of like downloading a free app. Like you have to have an account, you have to have a wallet, and when you execute something, you will pay a little bit, right? Uh, so bef there is this kind of a barrier. Like even if what you're paying is like one hundredth of a cent, it's still a payment. Like it still feels like you're paying, right? Uh, whereas when you're downloading the app, you don't really feel the cost of uh, being a part of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, Google or, or, or Apple. Okay, um, so to kind of appreciate um, some of those, uh, some of the challenges and some of what this technology enables, you have to kind of dig a little bit deeper into how it works and you know how exactly, what is exactly is possible. So one of the interesting things um, that we talked earlier is that we can guarantee certain things without revealing the information about what it is, right? Uh, so for example, we can see in the ledger that I paid you something, but it doesn't say how much, right? Only we can see how much we paid each other, but nobody else can see, but they can see, okay, there was some transaction between those two addresses, which was verified and it's correct, it's correctly logged, right? Uh, so we can hide some of the things without kind of revealing them. Another paradox is that we can, um, I can prove to you that I know something without telling you what it is. So you can be certain that I know something, but you will not learn what it is that I know. Uh, so I mean, um, so I can uh, prove to you the knowledge of some artifact without leaking any information about that artifact, right? Uh, that is kind of unique. We cannot really do that in the normal physical world. We cannot uh, provide this, this kind of uh, provability. Uh, but in the, in the systems that we kind of have already, we can do that. So I can uh, demonstrate to you that I have two, it's not 100%, 
but I, you, we can agree to what is satisfying for you, right? Uh, so we can say, is one in a million uh, probability that I am lying to you enough for you to know that I'm not lying? One in 10 million, and so on. We can make it arbitrary small, right? Uh, and then, because we have to use a finite computing computation to, to do that. Um, so then you can imagine kind of what what systems can be can be built with this kind of capability. Um, another thing that uh, we can use it for is, um, let's say, the at the moment if I'm verifying the transactions, I have to uh, calculate certain um, um, certain quite computationally intensive calculations. Okay, so let's say we have the network of nodes and we all have to agree on, on a state of the ledger. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the transaction batch and I'm kind of doing this, uh, this burning of electricity, right? And then I have a result and then I publish this result and in return I get a little bit of a award, right? Uh, if I lied, I will get the award revoked, right? And if I made up the the answer, so I didn't spend the time computing it, I just made it up, the other nodes can see that the, the answer is wrong and they will reject it, right? So I'm kind of bound to do this computing to get this small reward back. Um, and this computation is kind of open. This is a public computation, right? But imagine that we have um, uh, a situation where you have uh, a mobile device, you need to do some computation on the cloud, right? So let's say you need to do, um, um, yeah, let, let's say you need to apply some filter to an image, okay? So you have a mobile phone, you took a photo, and now you're sending that photo to the cloud. And you need the cloud to apply the filter and send you the image back, right? How do you know that the filter was applied to the image proper, correct, correctly? How, how do you know that? Yeah, so what you could do is you could run the filter yourself and then compare and say, yeah, they didn't cheat at me, right? But if you can run the computation on your local device, what, what's the point of you sending it to the cloud, right? The point of sending it to the cloud is that you cannot do it your locally, right? Because if you could, then you would just do it, right? Uh, and then if you have to do it to verify it, makes no sense, right? So if you send an image to, to, to the cloud, to Google Cloud, and they send you some results back, you trust Google that they did what they promised to do, right? You don't kind of really verify it. You have sort of a trust in the service that it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? So now imagine that you have some banking application in the cloud. So you're doing some transfers, right? So I need to pay you money and I'm sending the transactions to the cloud, and I want to be sure that you got the money, right? How can I be sure? Well, I have to trust Visa, or I need to trust PayPal that it actually does what it says it does, right? So now let's remove that trust. We don't want to trust anybody, and now we want to send some computation somewhere else, which I don't control, and I want to be sure that this computation was executed. How can I be sure? Again, there are some paradoxes. So there are some ways cryptographically to guarantee that the computer who is supposed to do this computation can generate kind of a proof that it did the computation. And then I can verify the proof that they actually did it, right? So I will not compute the whole computation locally. I just need to compute the proof of the computation which they supply with the result, right? Uh, if I can do that locally, then I don't need to trust Google or trust another cloud provider to do what they say they do uh, without doing all the calculations myself, right? So I send my image somewhere, the, the filter is applied, I get the image back with the proof, and then I verify that the proof holds. If the proof holds, then I trust the image is correct, correctly calculated, right? Um, this can be done in two ways. So one way is that um, the computation is um, open. So the, the party which is doing the computation knows exactly what the computation is, right? Uh, 
which most of the time is fine. Most of the time, that's the use case where it's okay to have. But let's let's go back to the payment thing. If I'm sending you a million krona, I don't want them to know that I'm sending you a million krona. I need to make them do what they need to do without knowing what they're actually doing. So I need to encrypt somehow what they're actually doing, but I also have to know that they did what they're supposed to do. So it's kind of a second level of complexity, right? So on the base level, what we want is we say, oh yeah, there is like adding two numbers or applying a filter or multiplying matrices, right? I send you a matrix, you multiply it, you calculate that you've done it correctly. You got me the new matrix and the calculations, I verify it and it's fine, right? But sometimes I'm saying, well, I will give you a matrix, but you will not know what it is, what the numbers are. You have to do the calculation, send the results back, and then prove to me that you've done it and you will not know the numbers, okay? That's kind of uh, complicated. So we can kind of do the second now as well, but it's super time consuming. Like it's very long to do that. It's very impractical. And we are working on methods to make it more and more practical, right? So that's the kind of the edge of the research methods which are in this area of what is and what's not possible yet, right? Um, what implications does it have for us? Well, it has a lot of implications because of the mobile technology and the cloud technology. Uh, we have a lot of privacy concerns. We have a lot of ethical concerns. We have a lot of concerns what happens with our data, with those cloud services, with the social services uh, like Facebook and so on. Uh, so those technologies have kind of impact on how they will look like in the future, how those services may operate, uh, but also may have an impact of what, um, like from the legal point of view, because we need those trusted third parties, we can regulate them. So because we need to trust banks, we regulate the banks. We tell banks, okay, you have to know your customers, you have to introduce anti-money laundering properties, you have to track the transactions as, and see if someone is doing tax avoidance or whatever, like we regulate the institutions. But with the technologies where we don't need the trusted institution anymore, where we can have kind of the logic of the trusted institution done just in code, like how you're gonna regulate that? How you're gonna enforce that this will happen? Uh, that's kind of an open question. Like nobody really knows, like the legal systems are not ready to deal with that yet. Uh, you have to kind of change a lot of ways of thinking about this, right? Uh, so, for example, we regulate how um, how the driving license is issued, right? So you have a kind of a central governmental institution which manages the driving licenses, right? And then you have uh, the process. So you take the lessons, you take the exam, uh, you pass those steps and so on. And then it's kind of the institution which is issuing you the, the driving license, right? Uh, and you trust that they are not corrupt, that they cannot be paid for doing kind of illegal things and, and so on. There is some trust put into this, right? It's the same with degrees. Like we have a university and you take the courses, you take some exams, and then at the end of your degree, you kind of, the, um, um, the university sort of uh, together with one of the unit of the government issues you the, the kind of the degree, right? Um, but if you think about it, let's, let's think about the, the, the driving license. Uh, do we really need uh, that institution? Do we need humans to run that institution? Not, not really, like it, it's a very mechanical algorithmic thing, right? If you passed all the requirements, if you pass all the tests, then you get the driving license. If you didn't follow all the steps, you don't, right? Why, why do you need human to decide or issue you any, anything, right? It's like if, if those steps were done, then the final result happens and you can code this, right? You can make it kind of into a distributed system that you that the individual like our driving instructors just submit certain things. And then once the certain things were submitted and the final exam results were submitted, then you just get your driving license automatically by the algorithm, right? Uh, you don't really need the institution. And, but then as you were saying, there is nobody responsible. Like we cannot blame anybody if something goes wrong, right? Uh, so we feel a little bit uneasy about this new model, but it would be more efficient. It would be fairer. It would not treat and different people differently. It's like 
you know, it's just a computer program, right? Um, so what do you think? Like, is it possible to, to have it kind of fully digitized and automated? Um, <laughs> yeah. There might be something which will happen to the presenter during the exam, which interpreted by the human will be okay or will be not okay, but interpreted by the software, it might not have not have that kind of a big context to interpret interpret it possibly. Yes, perfect. So that's that that is the the perfect answer, right? The perfect answer is that the computers are very uh, rigid. They don't, there is no nuance. There is no, they don't deal with kind of un, unexpected circumstances, right? So for example, uh, we can have an oral exam, right? And I can ask questions and you give me answers. And then if something is not quite clear, I can ask kind of additional question, right? And then to clarify. So there is a lot of uh, human kind of uh, nuance into the interaction, right? Or I can have a digital exam with multi-choice questions and the digital exam just um, marks you at the end of the exam, right? Based on the choices that you've made. There is no nuance, right? On which one do you think the, the grand truth, the, the level of what you really know and what the end of the exam where, where the end of the exam is, how accurately that is. With the digital one, it's more accurate, or with the kind of a human discussion, it's more accurate. Depends on the teacher. It depends on the teacher, but let's assume the teacher is unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher is like objective. Uh, I think it's with the teacher, yeah. I think it's with the teacher, with the with the digital one, you might be lucky and be scored higher. You might be kind of unlucky, get scored lower. And you, the, the spread is bigger, right? Because it's not very fine-tuned. The, 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 the granularity of the digital exam is like more chunky. With the discussion is very kind of uh, subtle, right? Uh, so as, as you said, like if we have a system which is like fully algorithmic, uh, there is no discussion. Right? I was uh, applying for a loan in a bank, uh, online bank, and the process is like an algorithm, right? You fill in all the details, you press a button, the, ba the, the bank says, no, you're not going to get the loan. Try later. <laughs> and there is no human to say, oh, yeah, but, you know, I cannot explain anything extra, right? It just checks the numbers, checks what I entered, and it says no, right? Uh, with the... Like if you go to the bank and you talk with somebody, you have a number of questions, but you also have a, some nuance. You have some discussions. You can say, yeah, but I can borrow half a million from my parents, right? And the, 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 the algorithm was never asking about that, right? Um, so, or I have some property somewhere else and the algorithm was not asking about that either, right? So the algorithm is kind of very rigid. So for some, even trivial things, this rigidity is undesirable. You need a little bit of a, you know, uh, flexibility. Uh, and, and it's the same with the law. Like the law, we kind of like to think about the law as kind of a very rigid, but it's not, it's very nuanced. Uh, so depending on the circumstances, depending on certain things, we judge things this way or this way, right? Uh, there is, it's not a very algorithmic process. You cannot really have a trial, which is turned into an algorithm. It, it's kind of, it, it is based on this like little things which need to be discussed. Um, so the technology enables a lot of things and some of them are already happening. Uh, some of them have, have uh, impact on, on us and on the um, yeah, projects that we kind of observe. Um, but you always have to kind of step back and kind of see from the bigger picture of where it, it is heading. For sure, more and more things get turned into software. That That's an algorithm, right? Uh, so if you kind of uh, go back like 20 years and go to now, you can see that a lot of things with tangible things like with tickets or paper-based things and so on got digitized, right? Uh, you, like, you almost don't have uh, physical things anymore. Uh, 
So you have like the, the mobile phones, uh, which we had uh, 10 years ago, all of, almost all of them, they had physical button, right? Uh, iPhone had just one, but it still had a physical button. You see the, the newest iPhone, the, even the single physical button is gone, right? It, it's just software buttons. Uh, if you want to turn the computer off, you used to have a flick switch, right? You can go to the workstation and like flick the switch. Uh, now, the, you know, you, you have the power uh, module switch on the back of the computer, but the one in front is a software switch, right? It's not really a physical switch anymore. Like it, it sends an impulse to the interrupt and then the operating system decides what to do. It's not, uh, you know, you cannot cut the power. You can only cut the power through the back through the uh, transformer, you cut the power to the transformer, right? It's sort of like a safety button. Um, same with uh, brakes and, and cars and so on. A lot of things in the car used to be mechanical. They are not mechanical anymore. They're just con microcontrollers. Uh, so we, see, we do see that trend that uh, more and more things become just software. Uh, and on some micro level, that's that's fine. That, you know, you do have rigidity. Like you don't, you know, the ABS doesn't need to interpret things too much. I mean, it's just a sensory system with some kind of a controller which reacts to the circumstances, and the circumstances are very rigid, right? Uh, maybe the driving license also has enough rigidity that you know the system will not fail if, if it's an algorithm. Uh, it would have to deal with some border borderline cases, uh, but uh, you can probably define them quite well. Uh, with the degree, I don't know. Uh, I think that, that could potentially be algorithmic as well. With digital exams, I'm not sure. So we did uh, run some digital exams last semester. Uh, so for example, we had a question where you have where you have um, uh, you have the um the sequence in which the um uh, like okay you have a component in the mobile application and the component is kind of it has a life cycle right so it kind of is initialized it goes into the uh the stage where it can be displayed and then it's kind of hidden and then it's destroyed so you have certain life cycle of the of the component right and we had a question of saying here are the steps here are the different steps put them in order right order them in the order in which the life cycle works. So the students have to drag the, the things in, in order, right? Um, and um, what we forgot is to show the outlines of where the placeholders are. So if students were kind of, you, you have them spread here, and then you have to order them here, and then if they didn't do it correctly here, the, the computer would mark it wrong, right? Uh, so it was kind of a, you know, if it was everything was done correctly and the student was dragging them correctly, it would work. But because the student wasn't dragging it correctly, like mo most people got zero for that question. And we say, yeah, why most people got zero? Then you go back and you say, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, it's marked wrong, right? And then you need a human in the loop to fix it, right? But then if you have human in the loop, then you, you have to re re uh, put the trust back, right? You're trusting that this human is actually correcting it, not introducing you know uh giving the driving license to people who shouldn't have it because it was paid right uh so it, it, yeah it's a kind of a balancing act some things seem to be simple enough that you can automate it but then it turns out that even a small variation is kind of not working uh you have to be extremely kind of uh, precise but you can kind of get it right so like the second time around, we, we, we do that, we kind of corrected the initial problem, right? Um, another questions which we had was with uh, filling up the gaps. So we ask the students to, um, to fill up a name of some class. Okay, people can do some capital letters or small letters. Okay, we, we need to know that. Uh, people can put spaces around. Okay, we need to put that in place as well. But people can make a typo, right? So if somebody just makes a typo and switches two letters, right, gets zero for that question, is it is the answer wrong? What would you say? The computer says, no, the answer is wrong, right? But we as lecturers said, okay, it was just a typo. They knew the name, they knew the class, they just swapped the two letters, right? They get 100% for that question, right? Um, so there are some little things uh, that 
you know, and, and it's really hard to think about it up front. You have to deal with it, um, you know, when it happens, right? Okay, um, so we kind of spent the time chatting. Uh, we haven't read, read much today. Uh, we have a, a student who is uh, new, uh, who hasn't been here before. Uh, he's doing interaction design and he's interested in um, using kind of a virtual characters or some tangible artifacts when you have an augmented reality interface to kind of make it easier to, um, yeah, to assist the, the human, right? If you just annotate a lot of things with just static text or static blobs in AR, it overwhelms the user. But if you have some sort of a tangible assistant or tangible kind of a, a character or an item, which kind of helps you to make sense out of the complexity of the real world, you can kind of get, get better, right? Uh, so he is looking for, uh, he will be doing masters next semester, right? Uh, and he's looking for some developers who are keen on VR, on AR, to do some research on the like virtual assistants or kind of uh, 3D characters, which can be part of the AR interface or part of the VR interface, which are kind of like NPCs, they do stuff, right? Uh, so um, he was showing me like one of the video where you have the Google Maps and you can turn the Google Maps into like augmented reality street view, which which is not a street view, it's actually the view that you see outside, right? So it says, okay, I'm here and through the mobile interface, you actually see the, the camera feed of the streets that you have. And then you have like a map layer, which shows you the names of the streets and uh, where, where you are in, in the real world, right? Uh, and it has like a little fox. So if you say I'm, I'm navigating somewhere, it has a little fox, which kind of walks in front of you and kind of guides you of where you should be going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, instead of just showing you dotted lines of, uh, or arrows, which like turn left, turn right, right? Uh, and the, the fox is much more engaging. It's kind of much more uh, pleasant to interact with the interface if, if the fox is there and the fox kind of uh, jumps around and kind of navigates you through the streets. Um, so if you're kind of interested in, uh, in AR or VR research and if you want to investigate what would, uh, how this technology can be used for VR or AR, uh, then uh, please, tell me or talk, talk with him uh, directly. Uh, so we can um, have a kind of a joint project. For this course, you can do it together. And then for the master thesis, you could have a joint project where he's working on testing some of the usability from the interaction design point of view. And you're working more on a technology of how to actually make it possible, how, how to implement like an animated 3D character being part of the uh, VR or AR interface. Uh, and what is necessary for that, how, like for example, with the Fox, uh, we were discussing it like yesterday or the day before that, with the Fox, like if you see a corner of the building, the Fox kind of hides behind the corner of the building through the video feed, right? So it, like, I'm not sure if they done it really or is it just a mock-up, but that's kind of hard to do like on the technology level, right? That you have an animated 3D car character which hides behind the real object. So I, you know, I see a camera, so, uh, see through here and I have uh, something which hides behind the laptop nicely on this edge, right? That it doesn't kind of uh, blues and, and so on. So I, I need to have some sort of model of depth and I have to know that if the fox is behind this this distance, it has to hide behind this edge, right? Um, so you may have some technical things to kind of analyze for the, for the master thesis, which are kind of challenging. And then he would do some of the usability testing and some of the um, analysis of the perception of the interface or the usability of the interface. So that could be two different master thesis working on the same project together. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. If you have if you have the video, you, we, we can do that. Um, yeah, if you put if you put it here. So this is an uh, AI uh, Google Map, and normally AI we just see the real street. Thank you so much. We just see the real street, uh, and the, the side of the road. 
Okay. And now the in, implement of Fox that can guide people really to follow. So instead of just looking at the arrow, but the Fox will bring people to. So I call it kind of a tangible virtual assistant. Thank you. Yeah, like we have um, in our phone, we have Siri as the virtual assistant. Uh, virtual assistant in in AI environment, we have a three D environment, so we have kind of tangible virtual assistant who who help you to to achieve your goal in a simplified way and more engaging way. That's uh, the the idea of a tangible virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. We also can have another inspired from Japan. Is this Japan character? Japanese character. It's not from AR or VR, but we can have uh, inspiring from here. <laughs> like a virtual company, you for someone who feel lonely. So it's kind of you evoke human emotion because emotion no design is not only help you to do something, but also can can have a chat with you, can send messages to you. Mm. So, so it's involved the emotion. So I think that tangible virtual assistant can be. In, uh, can be implemented in AR to help people achieve their goal easier and more engaging. Now, what what do you call this? Is it AR? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not really, it's not right? <laughs> yeah, but it's not really real neither, right? It, it's something virtual in the real world. Yeah. So it, this type of interface, this type of uh, technology is like we don't really even have a name for it yet. Mm. Uh, but it is kind of a form of a pet, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but <laughs> tangible virtual assistant don't have to be a full uh, anime character. It's somehow can sometimes can be very simple, like just our hand. Uh, let's take an uh, use case of uh, an example. For example, instead of we uh, the company give new customer the user guide, a physical paper user guide, for to to, to guide people how to use a new coffee machine. They can just use AR and show the hand of how to touch the button, which button to touch, which one to, to put powder or to turn the button. So by using the AR hand, user can learn it's easier. Mm -hmm. And we also can consider it's kind of tangible virtual assistant. Yeah. So that's an um, idea actually. Yeah. So if anybody interested in 3D, uh, animation director, we can work together. Uh, of course, we can do a different uh, master pieces, but we can work in the, the project together. Yeah. yeah. Those, are, those are just some ideas. And I, I had an email from another interaction design student who is working with the like industry 4.0. Do, do you know that term? Mm -hmm. um, is there, yeah, so we, we can discuss it next, next week. But it's the idea that you can combine like on-demand manufacturing with the product design and with the customer. So the whole value chain is kind of digitized and it's kind of done in a, a top fashion. So instead of uh, doing it from kind of a, a traditional way that you kind of have um, some, you have some idea then you have to order the particular designs and then the manufacturing plant has to be prepared and so on. You have like a generic manufacturing plant with like 3D printers and so on, which can pull the particular models like digitally and, and do them, right? And then you can kind of like close the loop. You, you can digitize most of the workflows and most of the kind of loop uh, through some digital processes. Uh, and then the, the, the student was interested in uh, exactly with some of the gesture being used for like robot control or for uh, demonstration of uh, 3D printing capabilities or for example how to pick a, a, a model, 3D model from the repository which is online and kind of uh, drag it down to a 3D printer, adjust it and have it printed in a physical world. So how to combine like the kind of a gesture control and kind of manipulating of um, digital artifacts which have effect on the physical world and kind of result in something being printed or produced. Uh, so that the student was asking me if I know about students or uh, companies kind of interested in this type of work as well. So I, I don't remember whether it was she or he, but uh, the student was interested in collaborating with some technology students as well. Um, so I can, um, yeah, I, I can put the, your project and the other project on the wiki uh, and also for some of the